5,000 years ago, a tribe from the Yangtze River Valley followed the waterways to the south. They settled the Mekong in Laos and Vietnam, the Irrawaddy in Myanmar, and the Chao Phraya here in Thailand. This was the very foundation of modern Southeast Asia. Their descendants founded some of the greatest kingdoms the region has ever seen. They brought rice farming, Buddhism, and a written language. And everywhere they settled, they left behind this. This is the story of something now ubiquitous from Myanmar to Vietnam. Something that here in Bangkok you can find in markets and old restaurants, rural farmhouses, and right downtown. This is the story of the only noodle endemic to Southeast Asia. Something with a dozen names and a thousand dishes. Something known here as Kanom Jean. To me, you want to taste Bangkok? It is this dish. It is literally, this dish is as much a representation of the city of Bangkok, green curry, kanam jin. That's it. That's Bangkok. You want one meal to symbolize this city? It's this, especially here, you know, in, in the old city, a few blocks away from the palace, under a bridge with cars and motorcycles racing by. I mean, this is literally a bite of Bangkok. If you've ever tried Kanom Jean noodles on a trip to this city, it's probably been just like this, served with a plate of green curry. This, the curry, not the noodles, is a masterpiece of balance. Spicy and sour, salty and sweet, with fresh herbs and aromatics and a fiery chili paste, all mixed with coconut milk. If you eat this with rice, you have a heavy and spicy dish. But with Kanom Jean, with these light and delicate noodles, the flavors open up and you can start to understand why this dish is so beloved. This is actually the restaurant where I first figured out the magic in Kanom Jin. This is a place called Som Song, and it's deep in the heart of Bangkok's old city, open for 52 years selling perfect versions of old Thai classics. มาจากคุณแม่คุณแม่เป็นคนสุโขทัยก็ย้ายตามคุณพ่อมาคุณพ่อมารับราชการครูคุณแม่ก็เลยเปิดร้านเล็กๆขายข้าวแกงก่อน
Not only was Nam Ya recorded in writing, but there was a canal actually called Klong Nam Ya, which happened to be right next to another canal called Klong Kanam Jin. One of my favorite versions of Nam Ya is served here. This is the same alley across from Klong Doi Market that we visited in our Cow Gang video. But the most popular stall here, right at the corner from a southern Thai vendor, sells Kanam Jin Nam Ya. This is a place that I've only been once or twice before because they are sold out way before I usually wake up in the morning. Uh, it's the reason why we started taping early today was to get here in time. I'm going to quickly taste their famous fish, fish ball, Kanam Jin, and then I'm going to just put everything in. Oh my gosh, that's so good. I love how he told me, if I feel like it should be spicy, put some chili in, because that is like, it's really spicy. It's not hard to imagine why this would be a dish that 200 years ago would have captivated a Thai princess. It's kind of everything you imagine Southeast Asia tasting like. Rich and flavorful with creamy coconut milk elevated by a table full of fresh herbs and pickled vegetables. This, to this day, is perhaps the signature dish of southern Thailand, where coconut milk first entered the Thai vocabulary working its way up centuries ago from the Malay Peninsula. So I guess this story is pretty simple. Kanam Jin first developed in the south of Thailand, then found its way to the old capital at Ayutthaya, where eventually it became a favorite of early imperial Bangkok. Except, there's a flaw in that logic. Just a few meters down the alley, there's another vendor selling another dish made with Kanam Jin. And this has roots in a completely different empire. One based as far from the Malay Peninsula as any part of modern Thailand. The mountains in the far north. Unlike Nam Ya, which is silky and approachable, this is a tomato-based ragu made served with chunks of chicken blood, ground pork, fermented soybean paste, and the flowers of the cotton tree. It's often referred to as a Thai bolognese. Kanam Jin Nam Niao was the signature dish of the La Na, the old kingdom based in Chiang Mai, which ruled what's now northern Thailand from the 13th century until the 1770s. In the La Na kingdom, this dish was the iconic food of the empire. This is what was served at weddings and festivals and imperial banquets. It has almost nothing in common with Nam Ya, and it wasn't even developed by the same ethnic group. This comes from the Thai Yai, the people of Shan State in Myanmar, Assam in Malaysia, and Yunnan Province, China. So how is it possible that two separate ethnic groups more than a thousand miles apart independently developed a local food culture centered around exactly the same noodles. Five thousand years ago in Southeast Asia, in what's known as the Bronze Age, back in the days when the pyramids in Egypt were first built, here none of the great empires had yet been established. There were no Khmers, no Siamese, no Tongu or Champa. But what you would find here was a civilization known as the Mon. They came from China, sweeping down from the Yangtze River Basin where they'd cultivated farmland. I mean, they'd literally been present right at the advent of irrigation. The Mon ethnic group were the first to settle the sites that would become, thousands of years later, some of the region's greatest cities, the capitals of modern countries like Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, and yes, Thailand. Theirs was a civilization that shaped Southeast Asia. They brought rice farming, a language that would form the basis of most languages here today. And their food, well, let's jump to that for a minute. Let me quickly detour and talk about what Kanam Jin actually is. To make Kanam Jin noodles, you take rice milled into flour and knead it into a dough. Then the dough is placed in a traditional mold for what we call vermicelli, and it's pressed through the mold and directly into boiling water. The process is physically exhausting and labor-intensive, and that's the reason why there's a misconception 
that kanamjin means fermented rice noodles. The rice flour dough doesn't have to be fermented. If the noodles are made fresh, like in the traditional way, or made fresh and then dried, there's no need to ferment anything. The point of fermenting, which basically means leaving the dough for about three days, which gives it the mild sour flavor it's known for, that's a technique of market sellers. It makes the product last longer. You can make a bigger batch and your customers can buy more of it. But kanam jin, or whatever it's called in other languages, just means this type of rice noodle, made or historically made like this, by extruding rice dough into boiling water. And if we look at the map again and wonder how Nam Ya and Nam Niao developed independently of each other, they didn't. Because there's archaeological evidence that as far back as the 9th century and maybe as much as a millennia earlier, this noodle was being made here, right in between the two other places, where Kanam Jin forms the foundation of what is still to this day the national dish of Myanmar. That, of course, is something called Mohinga. It was only a few weeks ago here on the channel when we did our first introduction to Burmese cuisine. And the most important dish, or at least the most beloved all across the country, is Mohinga. The version here at the Mandalay Food House is a classic Mohinga, the most common style found in the country's major cities. It's the unofficial national dish of Myanmar, a point of pride of all of the Burmese restaurants I've been to here in Bangkok, which compete to make the best version of this iconic and incredible dish. But just like Thai Kanam Jin, Mohinga doesn't look the same everywhere in Myanmar. There are countless regional variations across the country. There are varieties made with broth using peanuts and chickpeas. There are versions made with lots of soup and others that are almost a salad, with fresh fish or pickled seafood, sweet or spicy or sour. And they all have an old history and they all use these noodles. It's exactly the same story as how Kanam Jin evolved in all corners of Thailand. This shows up everywhere because it was brought by the Mon people. We might not have archaeological or DNA evidence of everywhere the Mon group spread all those years ago. What we do have is this noodle. And if that's the case, and Kanam Jin doesn't belong to any specific country, but rather an ethnic group that inhabited a lot of Southeast Asia, then this mission just got bigger. So how do we retrace the steps of the Mon people when outside of one ethnic Mon province in today's Myanmar, we don't really know where to look? Let me quickly bring up a couple of caveats before we really start broadening our search. First, there are actually three separate origin stories of these noodles. There's the story of the Mon people, of course. Then there's the Chinese, who have their own ancient history of making rice noodles, including in part of Yunnan province, where they use the same technique that we see with Kanam Jin. And finally, there's the Indian subcontinent, where something called Idiapam has almost 2,000 years of history in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, and especially on the island of Sri Lanka, where this dish goes by the name of string hoppers and is just as widespread today as Mohinga in Myanmar or Kanam Jin here. And then there's the linguistic origin of the name here in Thailand. Kanam Jin literally translates to Chinese snack. But again, all roads lead back to the Mon. It is possible that the noodles did originate in China, but that's because so did the Mon people, who followed the Mekong right through the part of Yunnan where the same technique is utilized on their way to settle the region. And we mentioned right in the open that the Mon were the first to introduce Buddhism to Southeast Asia. Well, that happened because of their close relationship with Theravada missionaries who arrived in Myanmar as far back as the first century AD. The Mon and the Buddhist emissaries forged a close bond, and there's widespread evidence of trade links between these two groups. And the Theravada, the first to evangelize Buddhism, they came from Sri Lanka. And as for the word Kanam Jin, well, that one's easy. It might mean Chinese snack today, but that's just an evolution of the original word, Hanam Chin, which means boiled noodles in the Mon language.
But when we talk about language, it does get more complicated because there's another kind of rice noodle in Thailand called mi hun. This is most definitely from the Chinese, specifically the Hokkien, where it's called bi hun. Now, Hokkien bi hun is a different thing than kanam jin, but over the last few centuries, most of the languages in this part of the world simply adopted a form of this word as a catch-all term for any rice noodles. That's where you get things like bihun in Singapore, mihun in Malaysia, and bihon in the Philippines. So all we can really do is just focus on the noodle itself, and that puts pins on the map in Thailand and Myanmar, China and Sri Lanka, and in northern Vietnam, where something very old and very familiar forms the basis of one of the best dishes anywhere on the planet. All right, so this is bun cha, um, which if you watched our video on the top 10 foods in Southeast Asia, in my own very subjective opinion, uh, this is one of my top five. This is the taste of Hanoi. This is one of the all-time great Vietnamese dishes. This is what Barack Obama and Anthony Bourdain had when they ate together and um, uh, in Hanoi, that famous interview. So uh, me and Jasper versus Bourdain and Obama, which uh, lunch duo would you rather join? I hope somebody out there picks us. We're pretty interesting. As common as Kanam Jin is in Thailand, it's absolutely ubiquitous in Vietnam. Here it's called Bun, as in Bun Bo Hue, Bun Ryu, and this, Bun Cha, one of the greatest dishes anywhere. It's just a noodle, right? It's like rice. It's a platform for flavors. And, you know, it doesn't really matter where this came from because we can say, oh, well, that evolved from the Mon people in Myanmar, in Thailand, you know. And I know that there's going to be people in Vietnam who are going to say, oh, but this is a quintessential Vietnamese dish. It is because of this, because of the grilled pork, because of the sausage, because of the, the, the fish sauce, you know, that incredibly uniquely Vietnamese flavor. This is just a way to kind of, you know, it's the artist's palate, and it's up to the artist what to do with it. And even though the noodle's the same, the dish itself is completely different from anything else we've eaten today. I just forget how much I love bun cha. This is just one of the great dishes ever. The word bun, as in bun cha, is of course another example of an evolution of bi hun. And the Hokkien noodles are widespread in Vietnam. That's what you see, for example, used inside spring rolls. But this, this is something else. And something that looks quite familiar. It's possible with enough time and digging to go almost village by village across Southeast Asia to find the path of the Mon people through Kanam Jin. But what about the people themselves? If you're wondering what happened to the Mon and why they disappeared, I mean, they didn't. For most of history, there really wasn't a unifying Mon identity across Southeast Asia. Splinter factions of Mon civilization became groups that called themselves the Khmer and the Lan Sang. Even the present Thai dynasty descends from the Mon. And that's one more crazy story for this video. In the year 1287, a peasant farmer of Mon descent named Wareru married the daughter of the Sukhothai Emperor and established his own kingdom in what's now Lower Myanmar. The Hanthawadi Kingdom was at first a vassal state of the Sukhothai, but within 50 years became fully independent and throughout the 1400s was in its heyday as one of Asia's great civilizations, a Mon kingdom of its own. The Hanthawadi would fall in the 1500s to the Tonggu, surviving in pockets of Mon resistance until a short-lived revival in the mid-18th century. That restored kingdom would fall in 1757 against the Bamar, who would massacre the survivors, and waves of Mon would flee into Siam, where they would take refuge in Ayutthaya. The Bamar army pursued the fleeing Mon all the way to the gates of Ayutthaya, where they sacked the city with one of the most famous battles taking place along a canal that went by the name of Klong Kanam Jin. The Burmese won the battle and torched the city, so a new emperor, a nobleman named Taksin from a powerful Mon family, 
moved the Siamese capital south to Tonbury. And 14 years later, another king of Mon descent, who went by the name of Rama I, built the palace at Ritanakosin, and since 1782, this has been the Thai capital. And over the next 240 years, all those dishes from all those ancient rival kingdoms came together in this one city. And sometimes they can all be found at the same restaurant. This is a place where I eat at least once a week, or at least get something brought home for takeout. After all, it's right between Darius, Jim, and our house, so if she's walking past and I'm at home writing or working on a video, well, there you go. Lunch. Here, it's a really good version of a typical lunch counter serving kanom jean, with a serving of noodles and a choice of toppings for a little bit more than a dollar a plate. And this type of restaurant is one of the only examples I can think of in the entire culinary world where it's totally normal to see so many things that evolved so far apart brought together on a single table. The signature dish here is an incredible version of Nam Ya using fresh crab meat, rich and luxurious and elevated with the herbs and condiments. There's also an incredible Nam Prick made with peanut almost like a satay. These are two of my absolute favorite things here. But sometimes I feel like something wildly spicy and then there's jungle curry from Isan or something meaty like a bolognese, and there's that Lan Na staple, Nam Niao. Or of course, since I'm adapting to life as a Bangkokian, there's always that local classic, green curry. Unique dishes that all have their own story and history that arrived through war and conquest and the favor of a princess. But the one thing that ties them all together is Kanam Jin. We've said on this channel that the story of food is the story of people, and there's nothing that illustrates that idea more clearly than these rice noodles developed by the very first people who brought rice farming to Southeast Asia. And the amazing thing is that the noodles themselves haven't really changed. They're pretty much exactly the same wherever they've spread. And even through the millennia, as these cultures clashed and fought and battled, this is the reminder that underneath it all, they're still linked by this shared ethnic brotherhood. And whatever divided all those ancient kingdoms and empires, there's at least one thing that bonds them all together. The shared commonality across this incredible and complex part of the world, which happens to be something as simple as this rice noodle. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Thank you so much to everybody who's supporting us on Patreon, and we're doing our best to make as much extra content as we can to thank our patrons. Please check the links below for our social media.